Welcome to a special edition of Cybersecurity Today, and welcome to our listeners on our sister podcast, Hashtag Trending, if you're listening to this as well. Occasionally, we have a topic that crosses over to both audiences. I think this is going to be one of them. Mark Twain once quoted a famous person of his time, I think it was Benjamin Disraeli, as saying, there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. I have to be honest, as somebody who comes from a research background and I hope has an analytical mindset, and as someone who's been active in technology marketing research, I have to say that all too many times we have lies, damn lies, and technology marketing research. Many people make the criticisms of sample sizes and things like that, but for the most part, the issues that we have are not those. They're more in the area of bias. And that bias can be intentional or probably more often unintentional. It can be questions that are asked in a way that skews the results. It can be cherry picking answers. And the prejudice that we have comes from two areas. One, you want to get the results that support your point of view, your products and services. Second, I'll call a media bias. Everybody wants a headline, a hook, some little bit of clickbait there. I did a story yesterday on research about whether AI was good for development or bad for it. And you can literally pick whatever report you want to support whatever point of view you have. It's awful. It's good. It's so-so. And these reports all come from reputable organizations. But for our audience, we want to get to research that we can use. And one way I've found to do that is not just to have the research and present that but to have a great discussion of the research from a more or less objective point of view, to ask tough questions and take some insights that we can test out. And I want to stress that what you get from research is ideas you can test out or questions you can investigate further. I've long passed the idea that I'm going to get some magic answer from research. So as I've always said, I'm not looking for absolute truth. I'm looking for insights and things that might work more times than not. In that spirit, my guest today is David Shipley, head of Boser on Security. You might know him from his frequent guest spots on our program. Over the summer, he was part of our three-person Week in Review panel. And for those who are a fan of that panel, we haven't abolished it. But we're going to move to a monthly panel review and make room for some other programming. Welcome, David. Thanks for having me, Jim. Great. I'm really happy for my inaugural research show to have you on this because you've done some research and we've been talking about it for weeks. I'm quite excited about it. You gave me an early view of it and I've managed to put together some questions, but I'm thrilled to, to have the discussion of this. But first, let's talk about the research you did in general so we can orient the audience. I've seen it. We should tell them what it is. Yeah. So we, as a company, we've been looking at the issue of the human side of cybersecurity for the better part of almost a decade. Some of the big questions we've always wondered about is why do people click? How do we change people's propensity to click on things like phishing emails? How do we refine security awareness so that every single minute we take from someone's time actually re results in the maximum possible risk reduction and productivity impact to the individual? And how important is the way that we talk about things to being successful in this? Security awareness has been around for 30 years. We still have the same challenges today, and it is one of the least well-researched areas of cybersecurity. The opportunity as a um, technology company, keep in mind, we came from a university, it's in our DNA, to look at our data and work with partner institutions with our aggregate, depersonalized, anonymized data to understand things and to bring in perspectives outside of IT psychology, behavioral economics, neuroscience, biology, to better understand the human operating system and the human condition. Ultimately, how do we create security programs that are humane and kind to humans? All too often, you'll walk into a room and someone is going to say, Man, stupid users. If I didn't have them, everything would be easy. And it's a stupid user fallacy because here's the truth of it. If an organization was truly full of stupid people, cybersecurity, not the number one problem. And they're not. People are the enduring source of competitive advantage for every organization of every size, public sector or private sector. It's not tech. 
tech is not a sustainable, enduring source of competitive advantage. It's not pricing or marketing. It's, it's your people. And so if we tap into that, we, we can achieve great results. So the desire to actually dive into this and then to actually look at qualitative data, creating an instrument to actually ask people how they feel about security, what do they care about, and then take quantitative data in the form of something that we actually had very measurable results, phishing simulations, clicks, reports, and ignores, and start to understand some of the relationships between these things. That's the research. And you know, our, the corpus that, that we're working from now, it's funny, when we looked at the study a couple of weeks ago, it was 928,000 people when it comes to the phishing data set. We're now up to 977,000 people that we fished. I'm going to be really excited. I'm going to have a 1 million person fished some kind of a prize pack, just whoever that lucky person is. And about 150,000 of those who we did the qualitative uh, research over three years with to understand the relationship between phishing behaviors and the answers they gave to our survey. There's a blues song, Gone Fishing. I think you should, I think you should find the <laughs> CD and send that out to the millionth person in there. I always get distracted when I'm talking to you because, and, but I don't want to pass this up. You talked about respect and another famous musician, Aretha Franklin said it right, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. When you lose that for your user, I hate the word users. I just hate yep. it because if they're users, what are you? You know, <laughs> and so, but we'll put that aside. We're going to come back to that conversation, but you came out of the university, you you wanted yep. to found a firm, you did, a, you focus on fishing. Why is that? So when I started at the University of New Brunswick, fishing was a huge problem for us. We were dealing with several hundred sort of credentials being captured, bad things happening from 2014 to 2016. And so we needed to get a handle on that. We used a, a vendor at the time to conduct fishing exercises. We fished too much. We were fishing weekly. That really upset people. Then we were fishing less than monthly and that wasn't getting the sustained results we wanted to get. And then we, we found the sweet spot, the Goldilocks about monthly fishing. Here's something where we could simulate a very prominent attack type that was quite frequent that arrived at people and we could actually deliver education to try and see if we could cut it down. And if through repeated experience, people would actually change their behavior and they did. From the research that we did with phishing, we realized that security awareness has to involve a component, an opportunity for people to apply the knowledge and learning. And it also has to have an example that keeps it top of mind that helps get around things like optimism bias. And, you know, what's interesting about this body of research we're going to talk about is we found some really strong relationships that show the incredible power of optimism bias and why we need to focus on that so much. Bosran now serves 1,037 organizations, primarily in Canada. We're growing the U.S. and we have a smattering of really cool companies in the U.K., Sweden, and South Africa. It's the furthest away I've ever traveled now because of that. So we, we've got all this phishing data. And then we have a, a subset of that data are folks who use our default recipe of security awareness, which is when we onboard folks, you don't as, as an admin have to pick bunch of modules and then pick what fishes and then apply it to a group and do all this manual work. We automated all that because it's a waste of time. But what's really cool is we're one of the few companies that can say we've run the exact same experiment across hundreds of organizations and hundreds of thousands of people. And now we've got a data set that's really, really interesting. And, and, and so 977,000 people fished, you know, as of two days ago. And, and of that 977,000, we've got about 150,000 who have over three years completed the same qualitative survey, about 25 questions, take five minutes to complete. And we then combined their survey answers into the click results and cohorted them in really interesting ways. Thank you. That was what I needed to understand because I was trying to figure out how you got the answers to these questions from phishing exercises. But you have yep. the phishing that you've done on behalf of other companies, the, the phishing exercises, and some quantitative results from... I guess, and some qualitative results from questionnaires that you put together. Quick question, I want to, how do you ensure that this is good research, that you keep your own biases from coming into the questions? So we, we, we know that there is always iterative improvements. I think that's the important part about science that people don't understand is that it's not about perfection. It's about trying to do those things, exactly that, limit as many biases, iterate and improve. 
the survey that we're working on is the second iteration. It was developed by myself, a senior security awareness researcher at a global bank, and one of the world's top experts in the human side of cybersecurity who has a social sciences background. And it was the second iteration of it. We're now working on the third iteration that we're going to put forward. But from that iteration, here's, you know, some of the things that we've learned from that, that I think are true enough to be measurable, valid, and relevant for us to advance the state of security awareness and to start tackling some potentially negative and dangerous trends. I want to thank you as a former journalist for not burying the lead. What are, what are the big takeaways from this? Number one, you can underfish, you can overfish. So one of the world's largest companies has come out and saying, fish as often as possible, you continuously get good results. What our data shows across 1,000 organizations, 76% of our organizations use our default. They fish monthly. About 20% fish more than monthly. So they can do biweekly or weekly. And about 3% are fishing less than monthly. If you fish less than monthly, you will have a median. So the median click rate will be around 5%. If you do more than monthly, so bi-weekly, weekly, you'll see a drop. You'll see that median drop down to 3.5%. So there is an improvement. But when you're at monthly, you get the greatest improvement. Interestingly enough, you get a median click rate of around 3.05%. But even more impactfully, the report rates are better monthly. So when you do more than monthly fishing, you get about a 20% report rate. And when you do monthly you get a 25% report rate. So, and report rate, for those not familiar, this is the rate of folks who spot the phishing email and click their report a fish button, say, okay, I know this is bad. or Something is wrong with this. Something's triggered me. And, and now I'm motivated to do something about it. And that is the most reliable, less manipulable metric when it comes to phishing. Click rates can be manipulated because harder fishes, you know, can jack those rates up, et cetera. So the report rate is a really good North Star that taught us that monthly is the way to go. Monthly phishing simulations are critical. You do a phishing simulation and you found that the impact of that testing is better if you do it monthly. If you do it too much, you don't get as good a result as if you do it. The sweet spot is monthly random phishing. And, that, and, 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 and we have hypotheses about why that is. If you uh, do monthly phishing, people know it's going to happen again and again. Um, it's not too much that they feel like they're being picked on. Fairness is really, really important when you're dealing with humans and psychology, but it's enough that it's like having the minesweeper game. So you're going to slow down. And what's really interesting about the optimism bias is people don't necessarily believe Ivan, the Russian hacker, is coming for them. But David, that mean guy in IT doing phishing exercises, I know he's out there, so he's not going to get me. Fine. It's the old uh, Batman, the Dark Knight, you know, not necessarily the hero Gotham needs, but, but I'll be the one it has, right? Wow. So, okay, so you're doing this regular testing. Of, yep. And you, the next piece that I picked up from you was click-through rates or click rates are okay, and you should check those. But basically, you think the number of people who report is the bigger measure of health of the organization in terms of fishing. It is. And, and, and like you said, because you can, and I see a lot of organizations, they have very variable click rates. They're all over the map because human biases, as we mentioned earlier, come in. And, it, and, and I did this when I was first starting out. The first fish I ever did at UNB was a, a fish that impersonated the HR department and pretended to be, you have requested vacation in a terrible weekend. If you're familiar with New Brunswick, April is the worst time to take vacations. Miserable weather. It might even still have snow. And oh boy, did I have a click rate on that. I had a 35% click rate. And in five minutes, I had a simulated credential capture that would have sunk our battleship. Two important lessons, by the way, for listeners from this, just from experience, don't impersonate your HR department without giving them a heads up and a warning and letting them know that that can happen. You will very much upset your HR department. And second thing at a university, faculty don't actually have to, or at least at our university, didn't have to request vacation. They can take it whenever they want. That's not the system where it worked for staff. So I assumed it was the same for everybody. But my God, did they get upset that they thought they had to request vacation. So, oh, yeah. you know, those are some interesting lessons on that. Well, in Toronto, the best one is there's a parking space available. <laughs> it works every single time. I have successfully fished staff members at a municipality in the parking enforcement branch with a parking fish. And I, I think for me, that was, uh, that was a moment of pride. 
Yeah. So let's talk about some of the insights that you got from this. One, 10% of fishes are clicked within two to four minutes of being sent. I found that amazing. This gets into people's habits and behaviors when it comes to email, right? And then this also talks about workplace culture and norms. Expectations for how fast people have to respond may actually predisposition them to that rapid, oh God, I got to get back on this, got to respond back to this, et cetera. And so speed is our enemy when it comes to social engineering. Slowing things down is a good thing. The majority of clicks will happen in under four hours from when the campaign is set. You've got a window of opportunity. Uh, if people are reporting things, that's when you're going to know what's hitting you and have a chance to deal with it. That's what jumped out at me is the need to not just report, but to report immediately and to take an action. Because if before word could spread and you could, you could depend on, you know, if you had an office and people could say, oh, look, I got this phishing email, they could stand up and tell their friends. But if you got, oh, you know, two minutes and it's covered 10% of the people, you've got to respond very quickly. Absolutely. Now, the thing about phishing is the days of a threat actor just hitting everybody in the organization with the same fish at the same time, they've, they're long since over. You've got a variety of threat actors. They don't, it's not like they cooperate and say, are you targeting Jim at Acme Corp today? Oh, okay, great. You know, we're just going to tap. You know, no, you've got all these threat actors, varying levels of sophistication, varying levels of tooling, varying levels of specificity, hitting your email filter. What's been really interesting is every single email filter out there has a leakage rate. It can be as high as 25 to 30%. That is 25 to 30% of fishes fired at your organization, got into the net, the net being in this case, the user inbox. So that's why it matters that we lower the click rate propensity in organizations from across every single organization, every single vendor, the studies have been conclusive. Baseline phishing, if you don't train your employees, is 30 to 35%. There's no point even baselining your employees. And there's a lot of folks often ask me, like, why can't we just do a test without telling them to see where we're, we're starting at? Like, if you, are you doing training now? No. Then you're going to be between 30 and 35%. And the cost of fooling your employees without first training them about phishing simulations is far greater than the data value. So we, we got to get that click rate down and we got to get that report rate up as high as we can. But if you're getting on an untrained group, you're getting a 30% click on these things. What does that mean yep. about the, and you've always maintained, and I, I believe you, that the best of tools are going to have leakage, whether it's five, 10, 20, it doesn't really yes. matter. But if you've got a 30% rate on there, you've got a Incredible exposure. Absolutely. And, and to use my hockey analogy, it's shots on goal. If you've got a surge of shots on goal, then the pressure on your goalie, your security tools, your people and your security teams increases dramatically. And that's when the bad guys win. And here's the unfair part of the hockey analogy. As a security team, we can only put the goalie on ice. We are only ever to play defense. We can't go on the offense. And so, you know, that shots on goal is it, when those pressures strike, that's when we're going to feel. In one of your tests, you got an average click rate of 3% around there. And we talked about that being optimal. That means 97% of people didn't click uh, on, on something. What we encourage organizations, there's two ways of doing this. What I'll call the general guidance is that you want a click rate somewhere between 3 and 5%. Why? If it's less than 3%, you know, you really have to drill in. Are you testing hard enough for your audience? Are your fishes strong enough, relevant enough, contextual? In some cases, I, I got this small bank in the States that they've got a less than 1% click rate and they're getting hit with really hard fishes. The size of the organization matters because smaller organizations know what normal looks like. They have less turnover. Mm -hmm. People in under two years of experience in your workplace are going to be the majority of your clickers. So they've got all these natural advantages, but as a general rule, three to 5%. But there is a formula you can use to figure out what your tolerance level is for a click rate and set it. For most organizations, it will generally fall in that three to 5%. You can, you can figure out assumptions around your email filter effectiveness, your endpoint detect effectiveness, your team respond time, et cetera, and figure out how many fish we'd have to get through before one could make it through all the layers of the Swiss cheese to really hurt us. And then again, that, that will generally fall in that three to 5% click range. Okay. And we'll come back to that in, in a minute. But the other piece that jumped out at me when I was looking at the data you sent me was you've got two numbers that I picked out. One, you had a best case 
where you've got reporting rates of up to 56%, if I've got the graph right. Yep. But in general, you say only about 15% report after they click. So two important stories there. So the first story is the median click range, the, the average median expressed as average across the top 10% of organizations is 56%. Now we tell our clients that the first objective you want to shoot for is to get to 50 plus 1% report rate. Why? Because it means you're more likely to know about that new attack than not know about it. And the higher you can get that rate, so 70% and above, the much more successful you are, right? So the median in the top 10% is 56%. But then if you look at the median across all of our customer base, it's about 24 to 25%. People that are more likely to report are less likely to click. They're being vigilant. This is somewhat of a circular logic, but, but, it, but it actually makes sense. This is something that we're purposely working towards and optimizing. We've got this gamified personal cyber risk score that people can see. If you report a fish, but don't click, you get positive points on your score. So your risk decreases and you can actually see that sort of doing for cybersecurity, what the Apple watch or the Fitbit did for exercise. You're still on the treadmill, but now I'm nudging you, gamifying it, encouraging you. Now, the second effect in our score is if you click, your score takes a negative impact, but if you take remedial training and you still report it and it's your first time, you can actually get all your points back and then some. But what we've learned is even doing that with the approach that we have, the results we're getting is that the people who click on phishing, only 15% are going to tell you about it. So a new uh, path that our research is taking us down is how do we continuously amp that number up to get that higher so that people who do click want to report it? And what's really important to know about this is it factors into consequence models. If people think they're going to get in trouble for clicking on a fish, um, they are absolutely uh, not going to tell you about it. So you got to be very careful with punitive models because we want to make sure we get people tell us when they did the bad thing so we can roll on it. So that, that's what's really important on that research. Stop punishing, start educating. What are the other things that you can do to drive that report rate higher? The biggest thing that we've seen is multi-channel communications of not just telling people, here's your awareness program, here's your outlook button, click on it. Number one, have posters, encourage people, communicate it, talk about it, show examples of things you caught because people reported it. But the second thing that we've seen is, and this is work we've actually pioneered, is giving people feedback when they report everything, whether it's a simulation or not. And most organizations don't do that. And that's terrible because what happens is you gamify it. You tell people to report it. And then when they catch something real, they never hear from your security team because they're so busy putting out other things that they want to deal with the person that called in the almost accident. I'm dealing with the accidents, but that demotivates them. And what's also interesting from our research is one in four emails that aren't simulations that your employees report actually are legitimate business emails. So let's back up to this idea of getting out of that punitive idea or getting out of the punishing. And that was one way to improve the, the reporting rate. The other way was yep. to talk about it, to have conversations about it. Can I back up? And I should have done this at the start of this was I, as we, but I only picked it up as I was talking to you, you're doing on these phishing, um, tests that you're doing, you're scoring yep. individual employees. Yes. So, so what happens in our system is. It's part of how this personal cyber risk score shows for the for listeners and viewers watching right now, picture a score that looks very much like what a credit score looks like. So it's a base of 500 and a max of a thousand. And so you want to get your risk as low as possible. We purposely chose a, a risk model and a lower is better model because we were applying principles around loss aversion and psychology. And interestingly enough, for some of our bigger banking customers, they flipped it to be a security score. So it went in the other direction. It didn't make a huge difference on that. But the presence of a score and that people could see the score and how they could influence it tapped into some really important neuroscience principles around status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. This is Dr. David Rock's SCARF model. And so the score, seeing it, changed people's behaviors. What we did with the first generation score, the very first score was if you clicked on a fish, your score got dinged. If you clicked on multiple fishes sequentially, 
it had a compounding effect. Your score went into the red real quickly. And the only way to get your points back in the original generation was stop doing that thing. Like a driver's license where you got your speeding ticket, you would get your points back after 365 days. That wasn't motivating enough. And our first global banking customer said, listen, you got to do better. And they were the ones that actually introduced us to some of the more interesting behavioral economics and other theories we later incorporated into the technology. So the second generation score had this concept of reward points. So we're the only phishing platform where there are three possible states of play. You've got, I clicked, now I have to learn and get my points back. I didn't click, but I didn't report. So I didn't get any negative impact, but I also didn't get any positive impact. And I reported the fish, like a positive impact on my score. And it's, it's game so that people have to report 12 of the 12 simulations we recommend sending to get the absolute score. And I'll be honest, Jim, uh, when we first did this, I did not think people would care about a five point shift on a, a 500 to a thousand point uh, scale. And holy God, was I wrong. That was probably the biggest learning that we've had about this. And it's central to our thesis about for the published data that we have, when we look at other vendors, we seem to reduce click rates eight times faster than other organizations. And we think that's because of the gamification effect that we've baked in. I was going to ask you that next question. How do you sustain this? You may have pointed it out to me. The game, even a small movement, people are quite happy that they can show a little bit of progress. I find that amazing. Because normally what happens with these things is people, they just don't zone them out after a while. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a 65%. So, I mean, that's how I, a lot of people got through high school. You know, <laughs> I, I, I got this, this is where I'm always going to be, blah, blah. But overall, are people really wanting to move their score? People want to move their score, but what we're tapping into are well-established principles. So let's talk about status, right? So people want to be able to be perceived within their group as being part of the group, doing their part, getting that recognition. It's a truth in HR that intrinsic recognition, you're doing a good job. Thank you is more meaningful than some pay raises. Some of our clients use the scores and leverage that with intrinsic and extrinsic, fine. We've got some people that have report streaks. So they've been with us for years and they've reported 80 plus fishes. Keep that in mind. This person hasn't missed a fish. And we actually have things built into the platform that if you got a fish and you didn't report it after five days, it'll show up in your thing as like, go find it and show us that you know how to report it. So we do gamify even that experience. But, but the biggest thing about that 85% of people who click not telling us is that if we can move that needle next, and so we're looking at applying some new techniques where after someone clicks, the message they get afterwards that will actually show them how to report, why they should report, be very clear that they're going to get points back in their score. And if it was a real attack, this is where they can make all the difference. That, I think, is going to be the thing that's going to help a lot of our clients in 2025. Yeah. So you've got that the score is working. Is this sustainable over a long period of time? So from what we've seen from, from customers now that we've had for five years, yes. But it also comes down to how the, the organization chooses to use it and recognize it. And I'll, I'll give different examples. One of our national telco customers, they have a president's club. You often hear about president's clubs in the context of sales. They have a no. president's club for security. You get into the president's club by having a good Boser on score and reporting all 12 simulations sent that year. And you want to believe that that matters to people. I bet. That's amazing. Maybe we'll talk about this idea of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is much more powerful than many people in corporations think. Hey, it is, it is massive. It's the most powerful force in motivating people. So when we can tap into that, David Rock's scarf model is phenomenal in terms of looking at ways that we make sure our security awareness programs are optimized. And it's funny, we, we, we've given this talk about the psychology of cyber risk now to a couple of clients. One was a, a global bank here in Canada and, and giving a few more through Security Awareness Month. And they, they come back to us and like, hey, we could use this SCARF model, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, and the impacts that it has in motivating people to want to do what you want to do, not just in cybersecurity awareness, but in management. In fact, David Rock's 
work is all about what he calls neuroleadership. And it works. And I think that's the biggest part about the research is the findings that we have are so significant that while there probably are elements of bias embedded in some of those, some of them are so stunning that it's like, okay, this is important. One of the ones that I think is really important for our audience is this one is, is about the framing effect. The framing effect occurs that when people hear information, how that the information is conveyed to them, how it's talked about has a massive impact on how they process it and how they behave. We asked people this question. We asked them, having security tools like antivirus or firewalls completely protects me from internet threats. People that strongly agreed with that on a five-point Likert scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree, people that strongly agreed with that had a median click rate of 6%. People who strongly disagreed with it had a median click rate of 4%, 50% less. Wow. So if people think that security tools completely protect them, which every single vendor is guilty of this, of telling people whispering into the ear the silver bullet lie of cybersecurity, that it is that is dangerous to our organizations. And here's the other part. If you tell your people you have an amazing security team, it also has an impact. People who believe that cybersecurity is just an IT problem are 30% more likely to click on fish. So you have to be careful with how you talk about your tools, that they're important driver safety aids, but they can never replace a good driver. And you have to talk about our team is great, but they're like an overworked ER and paramedic team. You don't want to push the system to the limit. Help us out by being a good driver. In fairness to, to security vendors, I'm not sure that going in and saying, look, a lot of stuff gets through is a really good sales pitch. But I think the, the reality is honest, honesty is you have to say there's some leakage rate. And I think that yes. that's fair. But this, I love this idea of, of saying, you know, you're comparing your, your security team to be like an ER that they've, I think, I think you can present risk to people in ways that where they don't, they don't feel blamed and they don't feel helpless. So well, it has to be that balance. Absolutely. So, so when we talk about optimism bias, which is the propensity to think something bad happens to somebody else, not to me. So we see it in our research. So people that think that their organization is not a target for cyber criminals, 30 to 40% more likely to click. People that think they are not a target or the information in their custody is not a target are 30% more likely to click. So you have to actually convince people that they matter that they can't just rely on the security team or the security tools. And if you do that, then you're going to be creating the ideal situation, which is people and technology together. And that's probably the most important message. And you might be thinking, God, you're a security awareness and training vendor and you hate the title of security awareness month. We don't have an awareness problem in 2024. Uh, you and I have tens of thousands of listeners on this podcast. I'm on every national news station in Canada on a monthly basis, talking about some tragedy or other in the digital world, you have to get people to care about it. And, and that's the other interesting thing is that training frequency matters. Every 90 days, getting information back on top maximizes the inoculative effect of learning and you stay top of mind literally and your click curve is flatter. Frequency matters. Doing monthly phishing so that they don't get complacent. We had one client make a mistake and they turn their phishing off for about three months and their click rate double. So we now know that monthly phishing makes sense. But if you stop doing, people notice that you stop doing it. They are like, oh, it's like, it's like being able to speed in, you know, like, hey, there's no, there's no radar around. Uh, let's just go a little bit faster. Right. So you, you got to make sure they know you have a good program. Yeah. And to those people who are wondering, wait a minute, you guys are IT guys talking about cybersecurity. And we're talking about psychology. The reality is that so much of what happens in cybersecurity is not technical. It's people's behavior and people's attitudes. So I just, I just want for anybody who's tuning in, what are you guys talking about? I, I think you really stand back after the program, take a think about it. The, the weapon that people use is not technical most of the time. Most of the time, it's pretty simple. They get through because they play on some psychological effect on the individuals. Is, is I, you know, you've, you've talked about a number of these, the Dunning-Kruger effect is one of them. And I think may, may affect some, some executives who are resistant to this. And that's the idea that you're smart and you, you're, you're not as smart as you think you are, I guess is the best way to describe Dunning-Kruger. 
How does that? Absolutely. Dunning Kruger has an important role in end user training, and we're starting to see some signs of it. And this is where overtraining may be very dangerous. So one vendor came out last year and said, you should be doing a minimum of an hour's worth of security awareness training per employee, which I strongly disagree with. First, that is incredibly expensive. You talk about a hundred thousand employee organization, one of our customers, if they were to do that with an average employee salary, you're talking about almost an almost twelve million dollar a year cost to the business direct. And that's not even factoring in the opportunity cost. These folks have other jobs to do, and security is part of their role, but not part of their job. So that's problem number one. But deeper, we found some interesting things where folks that did more than 30 minutes of training, we went looking for this concept in economics of diminishing returns. For every incremental minute of training, did we get the ideal increase in report rate and decrease in click rate? At 30 minutes, we started to see negative returns. If you overtrain people, we have a hypothesis. We haven't proven this out yet. This is where the research is going next. There are two things we think are playing out on the negative. First, You've wasted my time. This is unfair. I'm busy. I didn't need this. And you have people that we're calling security detractors emerge. You've wasted my time. You're unfair to me. I'm going to be unfair to you. And I'm now a risk to you. So you can actually do harm if you overdo it. It's almost like doing an exercise regime and you push your body too far and you injure yourself. Then the second group are folks whose confidence outpaces their competence. And that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning-Kruger talks about this paradox where people with a little bit of knowledge vastly overestimate their, their competency. Ironically, people with lots of knowledge tend to underestimate their competency. It happens in pilots. This is something David Dunning said in a recent podcast. Pilots are most dangerous between 600 and 800 hours of flight time. And surgeons are most dangerous between 15 and 20 surgeries. By the way, you're going for that knee surgery, ankle surgery, hip replacement. Make sure you're not number 17. I'd want to be number 22 based on this research. And teenagers are dangerous all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you one more bias that I clicked through in there because, and this is something I, I'm going to lead you on because I, I know what it is, but I'm wondering how it applies to what you were training. You were talking about an anchoring bias in one of the, 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 of the research that I saw. Yeah. So one of the things that we're becoming concerned about is the anchoring bias is a propensity for a human brain to overweight the first time it learns about a piece of information, regardless of new information coming through later. And so what we're concerned about is in the early days of phishing, we talked a lot about looking for the sender or the subject line or the links, et cetera, very technical indicators. And we specifically said things like look for typos or grammatical errors. And now with AI phishing, it's much harder. There may not actually be a typo or grammatical error. Ironically, a human email is now more likely to have those yeah. heuristics. Yeah. And so if that's now overweighted in the brain, how do we undo the, the change that the world has now gone through and the unintentional heuristic where this isn't a fish, doesn't have a typo? So that's the next layer that we're trying to peel back. And where we're going with the research on that is we're actually working really hard on uh, a post fish click survey instrument that we're actually working with uh, experts at the University of Montreal and some of our clients to refine a very short random survey that will go to everyone that clicks in a given month and to start understanding why they clicked. So just to wrap this up, I, I want to get, because you hear about people coming in, David, for those of you, David's at a conference and we're, we're just actually moving around room to room. This will be pieced together. So he's, he's running around madly with his laptop in his head. I want to just ask one final piece on this. What are the big takeaways from this that you, you just wanted the big ideas you want to leave with the audience and with people who see this research? Security awareness work can be more than just check the box compliance to get your cyber insurance that doing this well and doing it right can have tangible, measurable, double-digit reductions in your risk quickly and effectively. How you do it matters. The frequency of it matters a lot. Monthly phishing, 90-day learning. How you talk about these issues matters even more. So the training content, making sure people believe that they play an important role uh, these are important key messages to refine that will tangibly reduce negative outcomes as measured in things like phishing clicks. So it matters. You can measure it. You can manage it. And you can optimize it. 
But for so many of us, this is just throw it over the fence. Let's find the cheapest possible way to do it. It's a corner of the desk activity and it can be transformational for risk if we do it right. But what I can tell you, do not overtrain your employees. Don't just think you can beat stupid out with knowledge and you're just like, I'm going to drown them in training until they comply. Be careful and judicious with their time. Be fair to your employees. Give them a win. Don't just have fishing simulations where all they can do is lose or not lose. Make sure they can win because gamification can lead to those results we've talked about. Final question. And can I post a link to the research? How do people get that? So if they, if they can come to the show notes, can I post a link to something where they can get more information on this? So we're going to fully publish the research in January in our annual report and, and all the different tables and everything we've done so far, along with some context. I wanted to share it in Security Awareness Month because it's so urgent that we talk about this. So we got to wait till January. That's okay. We'll invite you back when we, when we do that. And David's on the program regularly. So uh, that's, which brings us to a final question to our audience. What did you get from this? I want to try and do this thing more on research and, and do a deeper dive. Did we get it right? Did we give you information you wanted? Did you get something from it? Did you agree or disagree with something there? And of course, fundamentally, was this useful? And is the format useful? You can contact me at editorial at technewsday.ca. You can find me on LinkedIn, The Real Jim Love. My guest today has been David Shipley of Moser on Security. If uh, you want more information on the study, you're going to have to wait till January, but I'll bring David back to the show. Thanks so much, Jim. And thanks for your patience as I dodged between uh, sessions here. We'll catch you. At a, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Have fun at the conference. Take care. And that's our show. I just finished the edit in time to get it to you for tomorrow morning. Um, it's obviously at night here. Thanks for listening to this. Love to hear your comments. And if you're a security vendor with research you'd like to take to our audience, contact me at editorial at technewsday.ca. I'm your host, Jim Love. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. I'll be back with the top stories in cybersecurity on Monday morning.